Alright. Your laddie's ready. Three, two, one. Top of the morning to you, laddies! My name is Ian Taylor, and welcome to First Days with Mori! Hello, everybody, and welcome to our lovely, awesome St. Patty's Day celebration that was done after the fact. I apologize about the wait, guys. Work has been slowing us down quite a lot lately, so hopefully this will be a nice way to make up for it. Uh, so, I'm your host, Ian Taylor, and joining me tonight is my wonderful, wonderful, not wonderful, co-host, filmmaker, musician, editor, and artist, Devin Kane. How are you doing tonight, hey. buddy? I'm doing alright. How about yourself, man? I am doing better. Now that we get to talk yeah. about some... <laughs> I would say Irish cinema, but one of them is very clearly not Irish cinema, so I'll simply say cinema about the Irish, one way or another. That's a good way to put it. That, oh man, those uh, those shark leprechauns really threw us to the ring around. <laughs> yeah, I know. We sound drunk on this podcast, and you can blame them for that. <laughs> they just... It, forces have been working against us to get this episode posted, which is... A shame, because I've been looking forward to this episode for quite a while. Uh, we've, we'll be talking about two masterpieces tonight, uh, which of which will be revealed shortly. For the first film we're talking about is a very special film, a 90s horror classic that, for some fucking reason, spawned eight sequels and a live-action <laughs> gritty reboot. Why that happened, I have no idea, but... Well, money talks, I suppose. Apparently the first one made money somehow, so let's get right into it. Spoilers for all three films, because Leprechaun, oh boy, you don't want to be spoiled for that masterpiece, so you have Leprechaun, been yes. So, this is a 90s film starring Warwick Davis, who looks like an extra straight out of Troll 2, but sadly his makeup's probably the best part about this movie. And it's a very <laughs> strange take on the slasher genre, because... Warwick Davis plays a leprechaun that isn't murdering because teenagers are horny and isn't murdering because he has vendetta or like an intense hatred or revenge. He has a Serbia's sick family. He's searching for a pot of gold. And apparently the best way to get a pot of gold is by murdering people. <laughs> so somehow that happens and Jen Franston uh, uh how do I put this kindly? I am fascinated for how much she's improved as an actress. For someone who still can't act, I'm very surprised that she could be this much worse. And the acting only goes downhill from there. And it's a fucking mess of a movie. It's a steaming pile of shamrock shake garbage, and I loved every minute of it. I missed bad movies like this so much. I, Devin, what do you think? I, I was just going to say, it's like one of those things you really can't hate on. It's so uh, charming, despite, yeah. um, <laughs> despite how terrible it is. But I, I think it's because it knows exactly what it is and what it's going for. Like, it's trying to be... It, it, it's, the, it's the fucking leprechaun. I mean, <laughs> how <laughs> yeah. could it not be, like, exactly what... Like, it, it just fulfills exactly what you think it is. And I think that's what's so admirable about it. I mean... You have Jennifer Aniston, you have uh, this cast of characters whose names I really can't recall the life of me. But I mean, that's This is exactly about. like one of those cheesy horror movies that, yeah, you can just watch and appreciate. I watched it on a Tubi. I think it was also on YouTube for free as well. Oh. And, um, yeah, what better way to celebrate St. Patty's Day than watching The Leprechaun? <laughs> Well, here's an interesting bit of trivia for you, Devin. I read that Leprechaun was not always going to be a comedy. It was actually originally supposed to be a very serious, much more violent, mm. much darker horror movie with like elements of like rape and torture and kidnapping. Like It was going to be a lot more intense than it ended up being, but I think it was uh. Army of Darkness. That basically like popularized the urge to make like more cheesy, more campy, more comedic horror cinema. So the producers were very quickly like, just scrap the original idea. We need this to be a comedy. If you want greenlit, we gotta make it funnier. But I don't know if I entirely agree it knows what it is. Parts of it do feel like it's genuinely trying to be creepy. But you know with something like Evil Dead 2 from the get-go, you know it's going to be like a kooky, crazy horror comedy. Mm -hmm. Like, it knows exactly what it is. The tone is just very tight throughout, but this movie doesn't have the same feel to me. 
it, it kind of reminds me of Tammy the T-Rex, where it kind of feels like people looked at it and thought, this, this is terrible. So you know what we should do? <laughs> we should draw attention to how terrible it is, try to make it sub in a bunch of jokes that don't fit, and we've got a prime Kino comedy on our hands, because well, we're I, totally I, bad yeah. on purpose now. But I, I think I think Warwick Davis was kind of in on the joke. Like he's the one definitely mm. hamming it up. He's the one having the most fun with this. <laughs> and I, I don't know at what point in the process they realized that this was uh, better. It's better to lean to the comedy element. But I think it works, you know, despite itself. Yeah. Um. It, it, Warwick, Warwick Davis in his shitty little leprechaun costume and his shitty accent is worth the price of admission alone just to see this man act. And for some reason, he rhymes everything. I think that's a theme of leprechauns. But again, like, it's just comes off as really silly and ridiculous. Like, even when the film oh, like, is, like, trying to be scary, he's still doing these rhymes like it's a Sesame Street episode. Like, it's very bizarre. But it's... I it, mean, you, it, can, yeah. Sorry, yeah. Go on. you can tell you can tell that this was kind of made to, uh, for kids, but it has more of an edge to it. Like... Was I, it? <laughs> I, I, have one, I, I have one buddy at work that has like the entire collection. He remembers seeing it when he was a kid, and he just uh, was raving about the whole like series. And um, you know, they even have uh, Leprechaun into Hood and Leprechaun into <laughs> the Hood. <laughs> With, uh, I think Snoop Dogg is involved at some point. Ice but, tea. Like, it, it's, yeah. <laughs> it's 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 totally in on like it's it's its own joke. Yeah. Um, the only the only, the only time it ever gets serious is when it gets when it, when it's like Leprechaun returns and I don't know what it is about like horror films and when it's returning that's when they decide to be like more self serious and that's kind of, that's probably where it loses its magic uh, if I had to uh, guess but like the Evil Dead I mean remake. this first yeah I I think this first one works <laughs> yeah that's I don't know if it's really funny but it's more kind of like Tammy the T Rex where it it's funny and how it fails to try to be funny <laughs> like it's just like i i don't know how I'm, the whole film i'm like i don't know how i'm supposed to be feeling am i supposed to be scared of this guy because this is ridiculous like even when it does the evil dead shot like the tr they, they try to replicate that tracking shot of the evil spirits where they're kind of like crawling on, on the ground and they're fast forwarding the footage and it looks like the camera is just like from the perspective of this little man speeding through the forest and bushes but it looks terrible like they did this at how many years back like 15 years ago and it looked so much better back then like how do you try to replicate that clearly trying to rip off that same shot and do it poorly with more of a budget than the original evil dead like, yeah they, they, they got a lower possible. budget and and like the scene where they make him run faster they literally just sped up the <laughs> <I> mean... <laughs> oh did you notice the first time <laughs> it does the low perspective shot you can see the shadow of the cameraman. And he's like on all fours. Like just like in it's sped up footage, so it just looks like he's like a little baby hopped up on sugar, just like crawling for the footage. And yeah, that is what I meant when I said this is the kind of bad movie I miss, where all those little like rough around the edges mistakes were with like obvious ADR, you can see like the shadow of the boom mic, and I think Warwick Davis straight up hits like the boom mic <laughs> in one frame, mm -hmm. like and you hear it like dangle around. Just that like rough around the edges filmmaking that just makes it so much funnier to me. Like I laughed oh, yeah. at that way more than the actual comedy. And and, and, I, and I have to I have to give Warwick Davis props for not only like owning up to this role, but like really. Really, just hamming it up, and like he, I, I think he really believes in himself doing this. Where a lot of other, you know, uh, actors of his stature would be, you know, too, uh, not not wanting to be involved. Like Peter Dinklage would look down on doing a role like this, probably, right? Yeah. Oh, um, absolutely. He'd be like, but Warwick oh, Davis is, just yeah. completely owns into it. Like, I think that's the reason there's probably eight of these films is probably because he wanted to do them genuinely. Um. <laughs> yeah, and I can appreciate that behind it too. Like he's, I don't think he plays the leprechaun in every movie, which is a shame. But oh, that's that, you, that might be that might be true. Yeah. Yeah, you could tell like he has kind of like a Robert Englund or like Mark Muir kind of obsession with the character where they'll play them in just about anything. Like they're so passionate and so loving of the character. That they'll play on just about anything, even a movie set in space or set with gangsters where he smokes a big toke. 
in one certain scene and it, it, that dedication to the role is something i can appreciate even if the role is absolutely ridiculous and not mm -hmm. scary <laughs> whatsoever and it would probably depend on who's working on it too right like if he reads a, a, a leprechaun script and it's another one of these and it just doesn't have you know what the original had uh in it that made him interested or i don't know yeah i, I could see them trying to go for a different actor if he just didn't uh want to do another one but <laughs> no you, you can see you can see that initial passion at least in this first one that he was definitely very interested in being involved which i think is great yeah or he realized like the script was terrible and said you know what i'm gonna have fun with this <laughs> and i'm gonna keep exactly. having fun with this just as long as i get paid to, you know to wear this weird makeup and this <laughs> shitty hat it just again the motivation of the character i get he's a leprechaun but it's so boring like it's such a boring motivation for a horror movie character is like they, they just want some money <laughs> like say what you will about like the classic like virgin excuse but in, in something like the original halloween there was like a genuine traumatic event that caused that character to be that way and that's interesting it's interesting to see that manifest but here <laughs> it's like it, he wants some gold he want it, characters are greedy they need to be punished for being greedy it's like lord of the rings but bad so he just wants a pop of gold. Like, that's such a boring, oh, yeah. stupid, and, and he, uneventful he, he motivation. Creates all, <laughs> he, he creates all this mayhem literally because he's, like, one gold coin, gold coin short when they bring his gold back to him. <laughs> yeah. Like, he only has 99 out of his 100. So he just reads, it, reads all this havoc. Really, it's it's kind of detrimental to uh, for, for his cause. But, you know, you, you need a, a villain to do what he does in a movie like this. Yeah, he need, there needed to be a villain. There needed to be conflict, which is exact. And he counted mm -hmm. that surprisingly fast. <laughs> like, he must be pretty and, damn good with his money, because he just yeah. looked, basically looked at the pile, picked up, like, a few coins, and he's like, yep, yeah, one's missing. <laughs> it's like, how'd you count it and that I, fast? I love the very obvious and creative lighting when um, they're trying to highlight a patch of clovers. <laughs> um, basically, they just have like a green spotlight on it, and they're trying yeah. to find a four-leaf clover. Like, I, 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 I love like cheesy, cre uh, fake lighting like that. It's one of those things that I would have noticed as a kid. I'm like, why are her shoes green? Also, like, clearly they just put like a spotlight on there. Yeah, but, it's, um, yeah, it's so charming. Like, it's so charming just how bad the filmmaking is. So, like, the actors it, clearly weren't given like any direction on how to react to things. So, a lot of times they're just like standing around and. <laughs> just kind of looking at things happening not really reacting in any way which is mm -hmm. that gave me some very heavy birdemic vibes where characters will just stand around and nonchalantly react to things go give me some guys it reminds right now, me boy. of um, whoa take it, it easy <laughs> yeah it, it reminded me a lot of uh, like goosebumps like that oh, yeah. show back in the day yeah that's <laughs> a pretty perfect summary and even the vibe of it kind of reminds me of that and reminds me of like a worse gremlins but mm -hmm. i feel like it's just way more confused than any of those movies but that's part of what makes it work so well yeah. it's such a mess apparently, apparently the not. the one character that comes back in like the sequels this is according to my friend other than the leprechaun himself is ozzy <laughs> like the the really dumb character in this really <laughs> yeah of, 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 of all the characters apparently he made a comeback and I it, it, it like was funny like when I, when I was when i was watching this it's like yeah this young kid who um seems to be smarter than his uh than what his age would tell you and then ozzy who's really you know not i remember like just seeing their dynamic and i'm like what is this mice and men bullshit <laughs> but um uh, it's yeah it's so like that also reminded me of tammy the t-rex like all of the characters are just so one-dimensional <laughs> like that it, it's like all of the men are just like really horny and really <laughs> stupid and all of the women just like talk about men all the time and just want to get fucked and <laughs> it's like have, have you ever talked to anybody have you ever gone si outside and talked to anyone outside of your coke binge that you took while making this movie <laughs> it's uh, I, I don't know how much of it is intentional or just i i guess this is just how our horror story works like, <laughs> it was it was kind of cute too. It was kind of you know fun, like the like uh, you know the uh, the kid made him believe that he could get surgery to make him smarter or something. <laughs> but yeah, that was that that was one of two jokes that actually made me laugh. Like two uh, genuine attempts at humor that actually made me go like, eh, 
Okay, that was. And I remember fun. asking, my, I remember asking my buddy uh, after he told me that Ozzy were, was in the sequels. I'm like, did he ever get that surgery that makes him smarter, or was the kid just lying to him to make him feel better? <laughs> I mean, that's pretty obvious, but. Oh yeah. <laughs> um. Oh God. Uh, the best scene in the movie. <laughs> he grabs. The pogo stick. He hops around uh, on the pogo uh, stick. Oh, uh, dad. <laughs> he that was funny. the pogo stick to death. <laughs> for, 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 for our audience, I can't uh, understand what Ian's saying over him oh, laughing at his. Mouth. I'm sorry. It's it's there, just... <laughs> you know, there, 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 there's a scene where Warwick Davis as a leprechaun is uh, on a pogo stick and he's stomping a guy to death with it. It's great. It's hysterical. It's so good. <laughs> like, I'm pretty sure a pogo stick is not a piercing weapon. I'm pretty sure it can't, like, dent holes into a body and kill someone. Like, it might crush their ribs. So it doesn't, like, stab into them. He's just, like, laughing the whole time. And he... Murder well, by pogo stick. There's I, a lot I think, of I think they're really trying to that. illustrate just how dangerous pogo sticks are, right? <laughs> they're trying to it's, 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 it's become an illegal toy for this very reason because he could kill somebody. Could pass it. out. <laughs> yeah. Oh my god. You know, <laughs> you know, at the end of the day, uh, this is exactly the type of film that you think it is, and I would recommend, uh, you know, people watching this with their kids yes. over fucking. Uh, there's a video on YouTube that I accidentally clicked on when researching this, and it says, Leprechaun Rewind. We caught a real leprechaun in the movie. My dad is a leprechaun. You know, just this. Uh, and the channel's like fun and crazy kids. I mean, and it's a, it's an hour and 13 minutes of just people just yelling at a camera over some BS kind of story in this docufiction you know, style that's popular. In I mean, now. that fits. Yeah, that perfectly describes like the early two thousands found footage stuff in general. Anyways, it's like, oh, well, no, this, 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 this is like modern, like for kids oh. YouTube content, oh, people no. just creating things that rack up views. And I'm like, oh, no. at least the Leprechaun has a budget, and there's kind of a some sense of a story there. And it's actually so, funny. And, and you can find it on the same pl platform too. Yeah. I'm pretty sure. Yeah, you can find it for free on YouTube, and while you're at it, check out Leprechaun in the Hood. I'd like to read the IMDb pitch for Leprechaun in the Hood just real quick. <clears throat> and I quote, When free rappers want to get even with a pimp, they accidentally unleash a leprechaun who goes on a killing rampage on these bitches in the hood. <laughs> and, <God. laughs> and the tagline for this movie... Is evils in the house? We need to That's watch awesome. this movie. We need to find a movie, this movie, and have some kind of excuse to talk about it. Well, St. Patrick's Day Part Two, that there, it's there, gonna happen. There, there is one uh, Leprechaun movie I actually do own, and it was because I was uh, walking around in a thrift store once and I saw a Leprechaun Four in space. And I haven't seen any of the fil I hadn't seen any films at this point, yeah. but I'm like, this is too absurd not to own. And my initial plan was I was going to watch it just on its own without contact, without seeing the other films. Although I have seen the first one now, so I'm wondering, should I watch them now in order, or should I just jump right to four and see what that's about? If there's only one returning character, are you really going to miss that mu that much on the plot between each film? I mean, probably not. But... And it's the worst character. <laughs> Brainy being brought back to the other films, so you're not really missing much by not seeing them. True. Uh, well, and I don't know how many, uh, in how many uh, of the other films he's in. It's just that he does return, at least in like the second one, maybe, as far as I know. I noticed uh, Leprechaun Three has the highest <laughs> IMDb user score out of all the Leprechaun films, with a five point zero. That's very promising wow. for the franchise. Yep. So, That's crazy because I think this first one is only at like a twenty three percent. So Leprechaun Free, uh, looks like it's the return of the king of the franchise. So definitely check that one out as well. And wow. I was originally gonna give Leprechaun a two out of ten, but Warwick Davis makes it the inverse of a six point nine with a three point four out of ten. Please get drunk, watch this movie with some friends. It's a wild ride. Yeah. It's the kind of bad it, movie I missed on this channel. Please watch it. This movie, this movie becomes a six point nine if you're with the right crowd and and friends just drinking. Oh, well, what if you're I mean, with the worst kind of crowd possible? 
eh, you could still have some modicum of fun with it, I'm sure. Oh, absolutely. And you just focus on the movie and not yeah. the people you're watching it with. Which is Evan, perfect. S s since you're here, I know you uh, at least half watched this movie. What did you think of it? Uh, Leprechaun? Yeah. I okay, so I I've, I've seen a, a scenes on it, but there was a time when I was in, um, I think it was I think it was kind of like mid high school, and oh, yeah. I went to this stage where I really wanted to watch like obscure horror movie clips, and Leprechaun was one of them, and I had like this really big crush on Jennifer Aniston because I thought she was hot back then. <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, the Did makeup kind of creeped me out. I think I think I remember watching it and like, my my cousin, um, she's like really really into horror movies and. Uh, well, I guess kind of like metal music and stuff, and she was watching this, and then she recommended Basket Case. So I remember watching this, and then that, and then it put me in like a really weird mood just because the makeup really creeped me out. Yeah, but I, I'm I'm looking at some scenes now on Google, and uh, well, I guess like uh, gifts and just seeing all the gore and everything, it's bringing me back. <laughs> yeah, I, I do have to I have to do uh, yeah I do have to give like the makeup and then the lightings a lot of credit actually because they do. They make they, they do sell the effect rather well, like all things considered. Like the way they light the people is just kind of normal, like soft lighting that you would expect to see in movies like this. But uh, I like the one shot of him kind of sitting in the box and you just have these like rays of light hitting him. And then even like the very first shot of the movie, you have this kind of like harsh backlight and you just see him silhouetted. I mean, it is kind of mystical, but also dark and mysterious. So hmm. I have to give them credit uh, for m making the. Uh, what they could with this fair enough yeah I, I see the uh i see there's like a screen grab of a a guy with like yag on his mouth and a, a syringe <laughs> oh yeah wait so was that the first movie was that I'm just, I'm just uh yeah it looks like the or maybe it's uh i don't know which one yeah it's, it might be a i'm not sure which one it, i guess there's a whole bunch of them or eight of them jesus well, oh yeah, there's, 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 there's a shit ton of them. But like, like the first uh, couple shots of the movie, um, there's they even have this like rainbow lighting where his uh, pot of gold is, and I mean that's not an easy rig to set up. Um, I think I think you, you probably need budget, at least yeah. a couple lights with, with with gels or something to create that beam effect. But I yeah, I gotta really appreciate uh, what work they did put into this because it's not like they just threw it together like we did this podcast. They actually <laughs> had an they actually had a lot of effort to create this uh, whole thing, but I think the fact that they got rid of the self-serious element of it and they, they decided to have fun, I forgot to mention the best line in this entire film that makes this a solid 6.9 for me is uh, the kid at the very end. This is the last line that he says uh, <laughs> to Warwick Davis when he uh, kills him with a slingshot with a uh, four-leaf clover on it. Fuck you, Lucky Charms. <laughs> That line delivery was just... <sighs> it was perfect. so over the top, but yeah, because that it worked. It makes a movie. And, and you know what? I remember seeing the fucking uh, Nostalgia Critic review of this movie. Like This is back when I was watching reviews of movies. And, and when he was not, half and, decent. Yeah, and, uh, and, and this is where I would uh, look at movies that were obscure and ones that uh, I didn't know if I would be into, but I was curious enough about to at least find out what's happening. And... Uh, I remember just seeing his review and I probably like dismissed actually seeing the movie after seeing his review, but I'm glad that I actually just saw the thing myself. I mean, you shouldn't let other people's uh, opinions in movies or reviews in movies, uh, you know, affect what, what, what you think of them. If you're interested in seeing it, go see it, do what you think of it. That's my Yeah, best. I definitely agree with that, man. I, I feel like horror movies too, critics, like, they kind of shit on it. Uh, a lot, like, or at least like cult horror movies, they kind of get shit on by critics. Because they don't seem like, at least like mainstream uh, news media critics, anyways. Like, I don't know, it's kind of off topic, but um, just like any Rob Zombie movies, kind of like that. And then those are always like huge cult followings. And I, I find his movies pretty good as far as uh, like actually you like watchability. Um, like, critics just don't seem to really get horror movies. I'm, I don't know, maybe that, nowadays that's why they're all the same, probably. They're just kind of like catered to uh like like conjuring and saw and just, you don't really see stuff like leprechaun as much anymore right well like, yeah i like, guess like just like makeup and prosthetics more or less is what i mean it's like but... they forgot how to have fun 
Yeah, exactly. Like, I'll take garbage like this over some of the garbage horror movies we get these days. I'll take this over, like, Fantasy Island or, you know. I mean, the Bye Bye Man's also hilarious, but it's not quite as funny as this. So it has yeah, but, uh, personality what was, to it. Even was it if it's supposed bad, to be it's funny, though? Personal. Like, was it? No. Or was the joke that it was being, like, so self serious? Oh, the Leprechaun? Oh, no. The Bye Bye Man wasn't supposed to be funny, but it's so self serious and so stupid that it. It is actually pretty funny. Like, I might actually recommend on the channel. It's so... Oh, Carrie Ann Moss shows up for five minutes, and it's painfully obvious that's just a paycheck role. It's it's great. It's... I mean, as a king, I, I, as a I just see the memes no calling reason. it... I, I just see uh, memes calling it the pee-pee-poo-poo man, and I'm like... <laughs> that fits. And then I scroll past it. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Uh, speaking of nice, we're talking about Steve McQueen again, but this time... Not about sex, but about starving in the prison. Hunger. Devin, do you want to wow, introduce this one? Or do you want to introduce Belfast? I'll, I'll take a crack at this one. Uh, so Hunger is a 2009 film uh, by Steve McQueen. I believe this was his uh, directorial debut, correct? Uh, it's his first feature film. I think he made a short film beforehand, but let me double check real quick. Uh, let's yeah, that see. makes sense. Uh, I mean, oh yeah, he's made to... tons of shorts before this, but this is his first feature film. Yeah, that makes sense. That yeah, that would be the case. Meanwhile, I'm just gonna very discreetly look up the movie so that I get an <laughs> accurate IMDb uh, <laughs> description, and I'm not gonna say anything until then. Oh yeah. Yep. So this is a uh, based on a true story of uh, Bobby Sands who um, leads the inmates of Northern Ireland uh, in, in, in a prison hunger strike. And I guess they're, um, what they're protesting is this, um, I'm trying to remember. So they, they, they were protesting uh, kind of their uh, status as pro as like political prisoners versus normal prisoners. I don't, I don't think they wanted to be considered political prisoners or to have any different kind of treatment. Um, and part of this protest was them refusing to wear like prison clothes. So they would basically go to prison naked, and they were almost living in these like intentionally like slum-like conditions. Um, and then it kept, and then uh, refusing to cut their hair, cut their uh, beards, a no wash kind of thing. They were almost kind of living like uh, nomads or looking like uh, Jesus in a weird way, mm -hmm. like just a lot of Holocaust from, like, vibes from this kind of prison. Basically, and then any time that they were given food, they would uh, either throw it away or make it waste away in a corner. And then they would use um, like mashed potatoes to create like a well so that when they pour their piss out uh, under the door into the hallway, it wouldn't leak back into their rooms. Yeah. Really gross stuff um, that they were doing, I guess, in this protest. And what this film does is it just kind of shows you what happens in a very raw way. And it doesn't uh, seem to lean one way or the other, whether it's highlighting these people in a positive light or a negative light. It just kind of shows them almost as is, which I think is interesting. Like, it was all about a political movement that they were involved in. And um, it does kind of give you, like, title cards, kind of bringing up the speed of where we're at and then what happened afterwards. But otherwise, it's just kind of a raw, in-the-moment look at it without really plant it one way or the other which i think is a great way of uh, depicting it honestly it's like mm -hmm. was this all for a good cause are they crazy were they the, were, were, were they in their right minds you don't know and honestly like the biggest um the, there's only like one scene that's really heavy with exposition and it's a single take mm -hmm. conversation between him and this priest that goes for a, a straight 11 minutes um which is basically the entire reel of uh, of a film can. Like when they they shot this on film, I'm pretty sure, and that's pretty much like the entire like film magazine that they had this conversation, which is a bold choice, I would say, and I thought it was a really interesting one. Um, and and you could argue that was maybe done for economic reasons, or they just wanted to have like that single take. But I thought it was really effective, mm -hmm. especially um, considering there was barely any dialogue up until that point. So it. It just feels like the build is the film is building up the emotions of these characters more and more and more, and this is just the film letting all of that out. Like I think the context of the scene makes it work better because as it is, if you watch it separately, I heard people complain that it's 
it, it just feels like I'm watching a play. Like it doesn't really feel cinematic or interesting. Like they're just kind of showing yeah. off what these actors can do. But in the context of the movie, it is incredibly effective to have and, like and this it, break of dialogue. It, it does. It does feel like a single act play, kind of the way it's done. And maybe like one criticism of that is maybe it does feel a little rehearsed and a little acted because you are just seeing a raw take of these two acting. But it does. Un, like, it does unfold kind of like an actual conversation like they both know what they're talking about and we're just kind of catching up to where we're, where they're at but the fact that you've seen how like what's happened up until now um before they you have this exposition dump kind of in the middle of the film or like almost in the like the latter half of it it, it is really interesting and it does give it so much more context and it's really effective like once you are kind of stuck in that one shot for a long time and then they cut into a close-up of him picking up a cigarette off the table. Mm -hmm. And then there's another little monologue story of him talking about what he did when he was younger. Um, that was so powerful when it, when, it, when it moved into that. And it really held my attention. Yeah, like that so entire purposeful. sequence. Like the peak like of the, the whole, conversation. The whole, yeah, the whole conversation sequence is like 24 minutes in length. And you could pretty much get everything out of the movie that you need from that one thing exposition wise but all the scenes leading up to that just shows you this this kind of visceral reality that they've set themselves into and it's really bizarre because you're wondering you know what the hell are they trying to accomplish here them kind of living like you know nomads where they're literally um refusing to eat food and then uh wiping their shit all over the walls and making art out of it like it just doesn't make sense at first, but it's you're just kind of thrown into this, and it's really gross. Like when you see these close-up shots of like maggots eating their food, and they're not eating their food, mm -hmm. um, and it's like, what what the hell are they trying to accomplish? But then you understand what it is that they're going for later, and then you kind of make up in your mind whether or not uh, it was worth it or not. I I'm, I'm still not sure, but I'm you feel just like you're thrown right into the situation, and I appreciate that element of it where you're not. These people aren't painted as heroes or as villains. They're just people trying to accomplish something. Mm -hmm. And there's a line in the movie that I think is incredibly effective. It kind of explores the message of the movie in a way. Where Bobby says, I have my belief. And in all its simplicity, that is the most powerful thing. And I think that's kind of what the film is trying to say. That you know, you can have all of these wars and all of this conflict about different beliefs as much as you want. But the fact that you have a different belief. The fact that... You know, you believe, you actually believe in something instead of just miserably living out your life is effective. Like, it doesn't matter what you believe in, just as long as you believe in it. And I think that's what the film's trying to say, that, you know, there isn't really a good or a bad side. There isn't really a side that's more favorable than the other. There's just different sides. And taking a different side, just to have the devotion to take it, is a beautiful thing. And we kind of need to stop fighting over which side is right and which side is wrong and just understand that they're, at its core, just different sides with their own flaws and their own characteristics. It's mm -hmm. And the fact that it's in this backdrop of a very extreme time with two very extreme sides, and despite that, the film just refuses to take one side over the other. Like, you fully expect, like, the police guards to be really brutal and, like, selfless and brash... And they are violent in a lot of ways. There's a very uncomfortable scene when they're beating down their inmates, but there's also a moment when the guard goes out and cries. And that, that felt so realistic. Like, I've had, you know, I've been to hospitals where, like, all, in the typical movie, like, a hospital staff would, like, all go, no problems whatsoever. But in a real situation, like, some of the staff would probably, like, go and take a moment, go and cry, or, like, throw up in the corner or something. Like, people have conflicting emotions even when they're serving a cause like details like that are just not mm. in enough movies i believe and it's very important to show that for both sides and, of the conflict and yeah it's really like oddly humanizing for uh these people and i think that that's something that is rare it's hard to, it's usually not like seen uh, very often and i think it's very effective here like one of the first shots you see in the movie is this guard who's taking a smoke outside who's just exhausted and his knuckles are all bloody from having to you know beat this one guy i'm not saying that he was justified in what he was doing but it does show you know um the the, the toll that it takes on everybody in the situation and i think that's worth uh, exploring and it's worth showcasing 
just how much of an exhausting situation this is for everybody involved. Yeah, exactly. Like, it, that's what the film conveys very well is just exhaustion and the feeling that, you know, when is this going to end? Like, when is this going to stop? And there's very just uncomfortable, tense vibe throughout the entire movie. I think that's where the mostly lack of dialogue is really effective because you get so many stare downs and so many prisoners just living about their lives and it's just this sorry unfathomable quiet tension in the air that is really really hard to watch but in a way that's incredibly effective i say this film feels longer than 90 minutes but this is probably the first time where that's actually a compliment <laughs> i'm not using it against the movie yeah it's very much what they were going for and they absolutely nailed it no, I think, you know, I, I appreciate the fact that all these films were, like, around 90 minutes or less. Well, Belfast is a bit more, but this definitely makes the most of the time that it has, and I appreciate that. And what's interesting is that, you know, Bobby Sands or Michael Fassbender doesn't even show on um, on screen until 26 minutes into the movie. Like, I almost forgot that he was, like, the main actor. Like, you really kind of get to know the world a bit first. And when he first sh shows up on screen, you don't recognize him. He's this, like, guy that they're beating up, and he's got long hair and a beard, and you're not used to seeing him that way. It's only when he, like, force they, they sort of, like, forcibly cut his hair and wash him down that you realize, oh, shit, that's Michael Fassbender. Mm -hmm. And I, I've been looking yeah. at him naked this whole time. What the hell? <laughs> Why am I turned on well, by this? Uh, sorry. Michael but... yeah. Fassbender. He, Michael Fassbender. Yeah. Uh, was it, yeah. it, 12 Years a Slave he was pretty good in as well with Steve McQueen yes yeah no I can tell that man. these guys have been building a good relationship like he was in shame and 12 Years a Slave um I, th I think this was his best role uh of those three though like in my like I, I even like this movie more than shame I think for for, for what it offers mm -hmm. but yeah, um, you, they're all disturbing like you play some pretty like dark characters it's gonna be hard to go to as an actor like this it, I don't know, like the way he lost in it, and then Twelve Years a Slave, like different movies I know, but just the uh, Steve McQueen, all like the, I don't know, just the level. You probably have to get into a pretty dark mind state to play all the characters in each of the Steve McQueen movies he's been in. Like, well, I I know, I know that he had to go on a medically monitored crash diet to portray him because he 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 got really like thin for this. Yeah, he like, passed this, out. That uh, certainly takes, yeah, I believe. This uh, this rivals um, Christian Bale in The Machinist, I think, is uh, the film where he got really thin. Or uh, Adrian Brody in The Pianist. Those are two other roles where they got in incredibly thin um, for the character they're portraying. But uh, yeah, Michael Fassbender really slimmed down for this, and he was medically monitored, I guess, when they did that. And I guess it made sense. Like I, I was I was wondering how Michael Fassbender would be comfortable doing a role like Shane, but after seeing that he did hunger before this. I'm like, okay, Shane was walking the park in comparison. <laughs> yeah, but or, um, uh, compared to 12 Years a Slave, where he would often like cry off camera because he was <laughs> playing this incredibly ruthless, awful character. But Joe the Ojiafor and Lupia Nyong'o like kept cheering him on, kept telling him like, no, like you need to portray this character. Like it's okay, you could portray this character. This needs kind of character needs to be seen. And just that kind of encouragement mm -hmm. from under actors and crew members is what makes a film really work, in my opinion. Because, yeah, it's great to be strict to your actors and to try and get the best shot possible. But you got to understand, like, these actors are human beings with lives and emotions. And <laughs> you kind of need to under you know, get to their level in a way to bring out the best in them. And I think that's something Steve McQueen is good with, with Michael Fassbender, mm -hmm. as why he keeps casting them and. This wasn't the first movie I saw Michael Fassbender in. I actually saw him in uh, an adaptation of Jane Eyre, and I just thought, who is this actor? Like, this guy's crazy. He's so good and very handsome, but he's also really good. And this was the second film I saw from him, and the first film I saw from Steve McQueen, and I, yeah, I didn't regret it. This is, ah, oh, it's so good. I don't know if I agree that it's better than Shame, but... It's still like if, especially for a first feature film, it's cr well, absolutely incredible. Very. I, I guess what I mean by that is this is a film that uh, uh, Steve would have less to complain about, I suppose. <laughs> like, yeah, <laughs> it's yeah, easier to that, resonate with, I guess. It, it's a shame he's not on this week because. Oh, it's I, a shame. I think, he, I, th 
I, I think he would appreciate this one more so. Yeah, but uh, I, I wanna, I wanna do a correction because I just pulled up the IMDb trivia about that uh, long take, uh, scene that they had. So it's actually 17 minutes and 10 seconds, which is longer than what you would normally have in a film can. And I'm wondering, um, that they probably just had like an an, an even larger film magazine to, well, to let take me it, see what is... camera was used. Uh, technical specifications for him. Uh, it was shot it, on an Airy cam. Oh, oh sorry, Hannah. No. Uh, shot on film using an Airy cam lights LT camera and an Airy cam studio camera, and an Aeroflex 235 camera. So they used three different cameras for this movie. So I'm wondering if maybe they used mm. the biggest one for that scene in particular. And shot Probably. I mean, it's, it's a station. It's a stationary shot. Um, for 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 that uh for that whole sequence, and it's 17 minutes. Um. The camera remains in the same position throughout the scene. To prepare, Liam Cunningham moved into Michael Fassbender's apartment, and they rehearsed the scene 12 to 15 times per day. And on the day of filming, the actors got it perfect within four takes. That's insane. Yeah. But they did a lot of practicing too, if I'm not mistaken. Like they lived with they lived with each other, and they constantly practiced lines just while having lunch yeah. or sitting around. And you could I. A lot of people said it feels rehearsed, but it felt surprisingly natural. The engagements, like the breaks in dialogue, the need to like kind of like take a moment to like smoke a cigarette before speaking up again, and the way they kind of interrupt each other. Like it felt, especially for a first director's long take, like a lot of first directors kind of like they use the long take as kind of like a way to show off, but they don't really know how to use it in the way that's organic. For a first time director, especially, the long take is just feels really natural and engaging at least to me yeah i mean and really the camera isn't doing anything in that scene it's no? just sort of documenting what's ha it's just stationary it's documenting what's happening yeah it's not trying to show off or anything like whoa look what we could do with this camera it's going all over the place and one law take how was that happening it's just no we're just gonna place the camera and put but trust like in these fantastic actors delivering this great dialogue right when the story needed it and i appreciate that reservation and, and it's like when after you've held on to them talking for 17 straight minutes and you get this all this exposition you're kind of like picturing everything in your head uh, maybe you tuned out at some point but when it cuts away or when it cuts into a close-up after that 17 minute shot and it's like a close-up of him just picking up the cigarettes off the table suddenly it just feels even more engaging like it just feels a lot more intimate like all the sh all the shots following that sequence are all these intimate close-ups and you just feel thrown into the scene or thrown into what's happening again and there's just something about like creating that intentional almost mundanity and then cutting into something more intimate that's so effective mm -hmm. and immediately after the sequence there is this other unbroken shot, which isn't talked about a lot. And the second I saw it come into screen, I'm like, are they going to show this entire um, scene of a guard like throwing bleach down on the floor and then swiping all this piss back into the rooms? And yeah. it is. It's, it's it, He does the entire hallway in this one shot, and I respect it for that. Yeah. And <laughs> I, it, it, you know, so, so, so some people would have thought that it would have been worth uh, – cutting that shorter but i think showing the entirety of it shows just how banal this has become like this is just routine to them now that they're dealing with these people protesting and they're not really paying them much attention he's just you know yeah. he's just putting this bleach down and he's just swiping all this piss in the hallway back into the rooms like it's nothing yeah and, and it also it kind, of, it, it kind of shows just yeah, yeah it, and, and it, it unfortunately shows just how maybe in vain some of their initial efforts were because like in the time period that these protests were happening, uh, what was I just reading? Over a 25-year period, early 70s to the 90s, the RA killed 29 prison officers um, for their cruelty to IRA prisoners. Mm -hmm. Okay, like yeah, yeah. I, I guess uh, I guess these protests were happening for a little while now. There was a a card at the end of the film that kind of explained how many more people died before. Um, they actually did anything and it's just heartbreaking it's, it's heartbreaking when you see just what what happened to michael fassbender then you realize this happened so many more times since then before yeah. anything really happened that context and, just you know is a great way to make us empathize with the character like there's and it, yeah. it, it, it there's no like 
sappy music there's no like scenes when they're just crying down the barrel of the camera there's no spielberg moment <laughs> where they try they give like a really sad monologue and we're supposed to feel bad for them like it never it never stoops to that level and that's something i could really appreciate about it too it's very grounded and very believable while mm -hmm. also just so artistically made in every sense of the word but not in the way that gets away of the overall visceral experience i will say mm -hmm. Biopics that use title cards at the end always kind of bothered me. Like, it's kind of just like a tropey, annoying way of ending the movie. Like, City of God is one of the examples that did it right, because A, it wasn't a title card, and B, it was just like a, holy shit, like, this actually happened. Like, the film didn't break about it being the true story beforehand, or at least when I first watched it. Here, it's kind of like, okay, you just ended it like every other biopic, where they give, like, these sad facts to make the story sadder or these facts that make you go like wow i can't believe that i don't know it just feels kind of cheap and manipulative to me it didn't feel like a typical like biopic or like historical film up until that point and it did kind of pull me on the experience a little bit if that's an nitpick mm. well this is the prologue that they had at the beginning it says uh, northern ireland 1981 2187 people have been killed in the troubles since 1969, the British government has withdrawn their political status of all paramilitary prisoners. Ir Irish Republicans in the Mays prisons are on a blanket and no watch protests. So that's kind of how they preface this whole uh, situation. And and I think the first shot in the film, you just hear this like clanging, like you just hear the audio of this clanging. You see all these people in the streets kind of banging lids from trash cans on the streets. I guess that was part of the demonstration i'm not sure exactly what was happening there but you're just kind of thrown into things without giving much context beyond that little opening uh, blurb which i think is really uh, a fascinating way to go about it and perhaps um, a more and, interesting and, depiction of a revolution than another film we'll talk about tonight yeah oh and, uh, and, and 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 i'll just read the epilogue uh, really quick that was the no. prologue that was at the beginning of the film Please. and then this was at the end so uh, Bobby Sands died after 66 days on hunger strike. During this time, he was elected to the British Parliament as an MP for uh, Firma and South Tyrone. After seven months, the strike was called off. A further nine men has died. Um, 16 prison officers were killed by paramilitaries during the blanket no watch protests. And the following days and months, British government effectively granted all prisoners demands without any formal recognition of political status. So I guess it worked out, but it took nine more people to die first. Yeah, too many lives lost in the process. Uh, yeah. Was there anything you didn't like about the movie? Because, again, minor, very minor, just the use of the text cards. and um, Like, there wasn't much music used in the film, but it, it did pull me out a little bit when music was used. Like, it wasn't sappy or overdone or anything, but I don't know. I guess I was just, like, enjoying the silence and the soundscape so much and there's great use of sound with like the cleaning and all of the gross sound effects that come from like all of the prisoners actions they could just hear beyond the earshot that mm. music did pull me out a little bit when it was used and again it's not bad it just felt like a little out of place like it it, it had to be there because it's a movie when i was already getting I mean, so involved in experience that's it though i mean the scene that i was praising the most is the one that i also would nitpick just slightly it is that choice to use a single take master shot for that whole entire conversation um for 72 minutes just because it does feel a little rehearsed and it was like they practice it 12 to 15 times a day and although the dialogue and how they speak it does make it sound like a natural kind of conversation but um again it is very effective once you cut away from that and you've sat in there for a while um and this isn't a film that i would go back and revisit no. <laughs> like often but it is one that i would highly recommend um it's one of those uh it's one of those films that you would want to watch once and just to say that you did and it is very powerful and effective filmmaking you can take a you can glean a lot from what would you give it out of 10 ah i'm gonna give it an eight i think i, I thought it was really solid nice now i'm gonna give it a nine out of ten not quite as good as shame but still the brilliant horrible visceral depiction 
mm-hmm. of a political event and I, I didn't you, find it as like genre. upsetting as uh, come and see but I would put it up in that it, it, it's, it's just as close as that it's close at times but yeah mm-hmm. come and see was more I don't know what's the best way to put it I think it's because it went even more visceral with real gunfire and real killing of animals that it was just so much more intense in that regard yeah. so that probably just brought like the horror to life and the more and and it's the uh it's the title card at the end with the facts that really nails just how you know awful the situation is and that was the worst situation i would say and come and see but this this has the same kind of effect yeah exactly like it draws you in it doesn't pull you away with how much it tries to make you feel bad about it potentially like a film we're talking about next <sighs> belfast <laughs> the oscar nominated kenneth kenneth Branagh movie that is very much an Oscar movie, and I don't necessarily mean that in a good way. Let's get into it. Belfast. So, Belfast is Kenneth Branagh's, I suppose you could call him his passion project, uh, very heavily based on his time in Belfast, also inspired by Syrian Hines' time in Belfast and Judy Dench's parents' time in Belfast. Now, focusing mm. on a young boy that totally has nothing to do with Kenneth Branagh, I'm sure. As working class Belfast family, kind of experiencing the tumultuous riots in the streets of Ireland in the late 60s, and basically shows like how they're trying to live their lives and the conflict between staying in Ireland or heading to England, and there's issues of finding new work, and you know, Syrian Hines, the grandfather, passing away, and it, it kind of feels like a and what's the best way to put it? Kind of like a French New Wave film in a way, where it's kind of more about like the snippets of this family's life and how they're trying to get past all this political turmoil. And I, I don't know about this one. I, it, it has its moments for sure. There's a lot of great performances. It looks gorgeous. This was the first movie I watched when we got our TV fixed, and was definitely worth the wait in the visual regard and. It, it has oh, some yeah. great scenes in it, but I thought the film left me feeling a little cold. But I'm interested to hear what you think, Devin. I have to say off the bat, the cinematography was fantastic. And <laughs> I had no idea what the plot of this film was about. Just And, and, just, and just looking at it, it, it felt like it almost had like a Jojo Rabbit kind of energy to it. Um, with, with, with this kid kind of going about. And I thought it would be just like an overly sentimental take on... A, a time that was long gone i was not expecting there to be this like uh riot happening right at the very beginning of the film so it did it did kind of take me by surprise in that regard and it shows i guess the whole conflict was these uh protestants were uh ousting the catholics or something that's true. which seems like a, it seems like a, a silly thing these days for for them to be having you know, fucking riots in the streets over, like, throwing Molotovs at people's windows, like, really over, you know, Catholics and Protestants fighting. I guess it's where, you know, it was a time when uh, things were a lot more raw, but it, it just, <laughs> I guess it's our Canadian guard, kind of attitude yeah. where I, I don't see that ever happening here. But it was really interesting, and it did feel like it was a passion project. I just don't know enough about, like, the, I, I guess the time and place, the situation. Um, to really connect in some ways, but I did think it was a well-made film still in that regard. Like it did kind of throw me into into things as it was happening. I think this is a much better film than um what Kenneth Branagh had been putting out prior to this. Oh yeah. Um, yeah, and, and especially that. the cinematography and you know especially cinematography wise, I thought I loved the way mm-hmm. they like the the sensibilities of how they frame things um, with this uh, kind of deep depth of field and the wide angles. I really love the frames within frames and the way that they capture these things. I thought that, yeah, I thought they did a terrific job in that regard. Yeah. I'd but um, I'll, I'll be honest, when I was watching this, I was um, getting a lot of uh, things prepared for the podcast on the day that we were initially going to do it. And I was pretty distracted in the latter half. And I was going to try to rewatch it before then, but uh, I didn't get end up getting to it. Um, so the last, the latter half of this film was kind of blurry to me, uh, if I'm honest. But I did think it was still really. Uh, powerful and effective for the most part i'll have to re-watch it to really get a sense of how i feel about like the ending but i did like the the title cards at the very end i thought that they were quite uh, impactful um because it was you, you could tell that this was like a love letter to the city and to what his time was growing up like this is like 1969 belfast 
and it's kind of a love letter to the people um, there at the time. So maybe this just isn't uh, we're, we're just not the audience intended audience for this film. But then again, this is up for Oscars, and mm-hmm. this is a type, exactly the type of film the Oscars would love to um, praise. Yeah, for sure. Um, I, I think just the biggest issue I had with this movie is, yes, it looks gorgeous, yes, it looks beautiful, but I, I kind of felt this way about Murder on the Orient Express, too, and both were shot by the same people were. There's a lot of great shots, there's a lot of beautiful, well-made shots, but it doesn't really feel purposeful in any way. It kind of just feels like they're experimenting with like these really cool camera angles and what they could do with the depth of field and what they could do with digital cameras, because this was the first film he shot on digital in a very long time, if I'm not mistaken, mostly due to budget cuts because mm. of COVID, and they had to get things moving along really fast. They just didn't have time to shoot on film, unfortunately. But it, there are so many scenes where, like, there's a shot in the, where the father is walking home from, you know, walking home, and it's from a low perspective up, like, focus on, like, his footsteps walking home. And I can't, there are so many shots like that where I kept thinking to myself, this is a cool shot, but why is this, why is this the way that it's shot? Like, it doesn't feel, <laughs> especially compared to Hunger, like, it doesn't feel purposeful in any way. It kind of just feels like they're experimenting with all these cool techniques, but it doesn't really add anything to the film's atmosphere or experience. It doesn't really tell a story. It's just kind of there because they thought it would look cool. This is true. I mean, yeah. And this is like one of those things where just because you can get a shot a certain way doesn't mean is that the right shot for it. Yeah. And it's kind of a back and forth debate um, between, you know, the camera department and the writer's room is, um, I, I guess, purposeful visual storytelling. I did enjoy the cinematography in it. Oh, and I do sure. think that there were points where it definitely adds to the frame. Like there was... I can make two comparisons here, actually. Um, in Hunger, there was a shot that I wanted to talk about where you see this, like, splitting of two different sides where you see... And it's actually the shot you were talking about where the one guard is kind of crying um, uh, in the next room. And you see this, like, split shot where it's almost like half in slow motion, the other half is in normal uh, speed yeah. where you see all these guards beating down the prisoners and it's like this kind of slowed down footage. It's really choppy because they didn't intend for it to be slow motion initially. Um, so you see this kind of choppy uh, frame rate of them beating on these guards, but then there's this wall dividing them and this guard is like crying about it in the next room. And it just kind of shows like, I don't know, there's, it, it shows the two different emotional states of this kind of uh, scene. Yeah. And I thought that was really impactful. There are shots like that that are not exactly split diopter but they definitely have like a deep depth of focus and you see a character kind of um in one half of the room and then and then characters in this other like ha- like kind of room within a room distance away like i'm thinking about the kids coming down the stairs and he's listening to his parents talking about leaving belfast and there's something dramatic about that but um I, that might also been a, have just been like the most economic way to film it too, like to get mm-hmm. getting these two different things happening in one shot. And I did like how they lit that, like you just oh, you yeah. just see a little bit of catch light in the boy's eye. That's it. And I thought that was really fascinating. Um, but yeah, I guess uh, not all the shots were exactly purposeful in this, but they were they were at least well captured. Yeah, they're incredibly well captured, incredibly well lit. Uh, this was all set design too. On top of that, they couldn't actually shoot in Belfast because I think there was a complication with filming. Like, they were trying to film a yeah. commercial there or a TV series. So, this is all set design. And in that regard, like, it's, yeah, very impressive. And, like, the costumes are great and the sets are great. And it's just the choice of the way they filmed it was good, but it just kind of kept pulling me out the experience because it just felt like a student film where a student is just mm-hmm. experimenting with all these great shots that don't really add anything to the experience and uh, well, no no no, no. It, it, yeah go on it is based off of like true stories from his childhood so you can tell it, ha- it definitely is has that passion project feel to it which i appreciate yeah for um, sure. but it is definitely like it, it does definitely have those like films kind of school elements that come uh with a project like that right yeah and another thing is you mentioned jojo rabbit and 
like that film had a very consistent tone to it like from the get-go like okay you know exactly where this is going even when the film is getting spoiler alert more serious it still has that feel that like it's things are still exaggerated more than they sh actually are like it still feels like we're from a child's perspective looking in on all of the madness in the world surrounding him this movie feels kind of all over the place tonally to me like it feels like parts of it are mm -hmm. like trying to be serious and trying to be a little more gritty and grounded but other parts of it feel like really exaggerated and goofy like the two protestants the two like evil henchmen <laughs> that were like trying to bully the father into giving them money i thought those two characters were so goofy and the fact that like this evil dramatic music plays whenever they show up and like they're just like very growling and menacing and, <laughs> and have like this bad guy haircut and these stern looks like it's so ridiculous and over the top and you're yeah, kind of I, I really didn't that. get their yeah. I really didn't get their motivation. Like I, I get They're their Protestants guys. and they hate <laughs> the Catholics for some reason. I mean, it just seems like such a silly kind of conflict. I mean, I I just don't get the, the it, state. It feels that like it's there, there because it's a movie. Like we need characters to hate. We need like some kind of conflict <laughs> with the main characters. I guess it's supposed to like add stakes. Like kind of remind us that oh the father's low on money we've got these guys who are gonna close in on them oh no what is he gonna do but it just feels so exaggerated and hollywoodized and mm -hmm. it, the film is kind of bouncing between that mm -hmm. and trying to be like this introspective look at you know this political conflict and it's just so all over the place like it doesn't know well, this, what it wants to be this this is about the, the, this uh this place or at least this is the start of the troubles that happen like um that that happened in in Ireland back then um and this is uh what what funny what Hunter was kind of springboarding off of that this takes place kind of at the start of the troubles i suppose um and i don't know i guess i i wish we had an irish guest on here to explain what that whole situation was about cuz i feel like i'm just catching like glimpses yeah. of it without Saria, really knowing if you're listening please let us know oh, yeah also hi <laughs> assuming that she knows what that she knows about it yeah but um hold on now it's interesting so this is the sixth film uh collaboration between kenneth Branagh and judy dench so oh. that's kind of neat she yeah. uh she, she's getting consistent work at least and that's yep. great for you know mm -hmm. her going her going into retirement i don't know if she's ever going to retire she's a treasure but yeah, um please don't ever retire and she, also i just gotta say her and syrian hines carried this movie like i thought their characters were so sweet and wholesome like they their resemblance to my real life grandpa and grandmother is almost uncanny <laughs> just the way they act and the way they tease each other it's like oh women are a mystery and yeah and this woman will make you spell your guts out like that that felt like my grandpa and grandmother actually arguing and it's sweet mm -hmm. without being obnoxious and they feel they're the only characters that felt real to me and I actually kind of felt bad, spoiler alerts, when Syrian Hines passed away. And the way they handled it was incredibly cheesy, but I did like the moment they had er he had earlier with the kid where he's like, uh, are you coming to Belfast? He's like, no, I'm going somewhere where you can't find me. I was like, uh, that was the only mo part of the movie. I was like, aw, like, that's actually kind of sweet. I feel like my grandpa would tell me that like if he wasn't feeling well and I was a little kid like that. That actually got me, and nothing else in the film really did. So it's no wonder they're nominated for Oscars, because their backs must hurt from carrying this movie. Boy. Yeah. Well, we'll see how uh, how well this uh, this does um, next week, I guess. That's when the Oscars are mm. happening. I'm kind um, of curious to see if this will win Best Original Screenplay over Lookers Pizza, because apparently those are two the two like main contesting films for that category. Yeah, I, I still have to see that one, actually. And... Um, well, we'll get into uh, what next week's uh, podcast is going to be uh, oh after we do ratings. But um, I'll say that there's been some back and forth, and uh, we're just ha <laughs> having a hard time deciding exactly what it was going to be. But we'll get into that shortly. Yeah. And uh, t <laughs> on another note, maybe this is an unfair comparison to make to Hunger, but this film really doesn't establish the fact that the family is struggling at all. I thought like <laughs> there's several scenes where they're talking about it's like oh we have no money like we're barely scraping by we're barely having food and it's like you guys seem like you're doing fine <laughs> it, like you seem to be in good shape you're never like salvaging for scraps and I never like one shot of them like 
rationing out like food would have been enough but they don't even do that much and i i can't emphasize with their struggle whatsoever and i feel like if the film was more consistently goofy maybe that would be okay but it's just all over the place i'm just left confused and disconnected and the whole mm -hmm. structure of the film doesn't work for me either like there's so many scenes that cut way earlier than they should like there's a scene where the kid asks his dad um do we have are you sure we have to leave belfast and it just cuts right away it's like that it's like what you said with uh, <laughs> uh crap what was the movie about motley crew uh, oh uh, yeah, the I uh, I know what you mean. Yeah, but the movie about Motley Crue where <laughs> they go to the mental asylum. It's like, but we don't need to see any of that. You're like, but that's where the drama is. And I I kind of felt out for a lot of scenes here. It's like, no, don't cut away. This is the meat. Like I need, I don't need to like break down the tears or anything. But just a moment of silence, just a moment the of dirt. like yeah. trying to comfort him. I I need something. Like so many scenes, just every time I was trying. I was almost connecting with the movie. The movie just pulled out a little too early, so I could never really connect with it. Oh yeah, that movie was the dirt. I almost the dirt. forgot about that one. Incredible. Yeah. <laughs> but it's exactly. like they 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 skimmed on really digging to, to the deep soil underneath of it. They they just dropped the dirt on on top. It was like that whole the the time they're going to rehab and it's like yeah, who, or the narrator, narrator's in trap saying, who, who wants to see us going through rehab? I'm like, I do. That's what your character development is. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, and that perfectly describes my feeling with this movie. And it, it has its moments. It has a great scene of Catriona Balfe and Jamie Dornan talking about like Belfast. And it, that moment, I was like, yes, finally, you're letting the film breathe. I'm actually taking in these actors. And situation they're in but why aren't more scenes in the movie like that like that i it didn't hit me with the effect i was going for because i was just frustrated like why can we have this before like why are we finally getting this now like why are we finally getting syrian hines having an actual conversation with the grandson he supposedly loves so much in the hospital and not enough before like it's just very frustrating experience to watch and there's no way this film wasn't three hours. I refuse to believe there isn't a three hour cut of this movie some, somewhere because it just feels I'm so sure. disjointed. I mean, at the very least, I'm glad that they cut it down to a reasonable length. I think it only ended up being just over two hours. Yeah, for the sake of the podcast, I'd agree. And it's actually only an hour and 40 minutes. But oh, wow. Okay, so even better. In it's, regards yeah. of connecting with the story, I, I, I just needed more, I think. Yeah. Maybe we just need to be Irish. We don't have enough Irish in our blood. I That's, do have a little bit of I, Irish in mine. I have mine, a little bit. But... A little bit of Irish in my blood. And, but uh, um, th this is kind of interesting. I was just reading this. So um, so in order to be to capture some spontaneity, spontaneity on set, uh, Kenneth Branagh would often secretly roll a camera on scenes that uh, Jude Hill um, thought were just rehearsals. Jude eventually began to suspect what was happening, so the crew <laughs> taped over the red light of the camera yeah. <laughs> uh, that signaled it was rolling. Many of the scenes in the finished film were these rehearsals. That reminds me a lot of uh, how, how Stanley Kubrick uh, directed George e. Scott in uh, Doctor Strangelove, where I guess there was no like indicator on the light in the cameras then, but basically he would lie to him and say that we were just going to try these uh, practice takes and maybe act a little more over the top here, and those ended up actually being the takes he used in the film. Which uh, Georgie e. Scott really hate hated. Like he respected, like what I guess what he was going for ultimately. But he said that he would never work with Kubrick again because of that. So I'm curious uh, what kind of effect this had for uh, Jude Hill's character. Yeah, and uh, Jude Hill, like he's he's decent in the movie. There's a scene where he freaks out at Christmas. That was a little bit unconvincing, but mm -hmm. you no, know, he was decent for the most uh, part. He was very cute. It's very cute. I mean, yeah, he. I, I mean, he, he's a child actor, so I guess maybe having that red flashing light is a little intimidating. So I think it would. Uh, I, I think it may, it may it may have helped for um, him psychologically kind of get into the role more without thinking about what's happening outside of that, right? And yeah, I don't know what else to say about it. It's just painfully average. Failed to connect with it in any level. It either needed to lean in more to the absurd concept of watching a film about childhood, or it needed to be more gritty and believable. As, as it is, it's a well-acted, well-shot, unfortunate mess of a biopic. 
there is there is something that I really want to mention though that I thought was really brilliantly handled, and this Please. was a great use of the digital technology and the fact that so most of this film was presented in black and white. Um, but what's weird is that whenever they're watching something on TV or on stage or yeah, if, if it's a film that they're watching, it would be in color, like except for like Star Trek. Star Trek on TV was in black and white still, but whenever he went to the cinema or he was watching something on stage, it was in color. And they did a great job of like making uh, those scenes separate in color where you even see like the reflection on Judy Dench's glasses and it and what they were watching on stage was in color. And I thought that that was really a, a great visual like use of um, color grading. And um, I, I guess that shows where Kenneth Branagh's um, passion started to really uh, take hold when he was younger. But he would watch these films, and he would uh, see these sage plays, and he would be transported. Uh, chitty so. Chitty Bane Bane. He listened to us, like, yeah. one of his favorite movies growing up. And you can definitely yeah. see it here. And I, and I absolutely love that. I love that use of color grading in this. Um, <laughs> yeah, that was did, effective. Uh, what was the other film that they really used uh, color grading like that? Um, uh, I think Schindler's it was List. Single Man. Oh, or or Schindler's too. List. Yeah, going way back. But... um. And that was back in the film days too, like back when color timing was really like Hard a new thing on. that they could do. Yeah. Um, but this was, uh, I mean, this is the, the advantage of having digital, um, you know, color science is that you can create all this in DaVinci Resolve basically. And I thought they did a terrific job with that. Nice. Um, yeah, it, it has a lot so, good about it, but as it stands, it's just painfully average and disappointing. It's better than his recent work, but when his recent work is Artemis Fowl and bad adaptations of Agatha Christie novels, that's really not saying much. So, as it stands, I don't know, I feel comfortable giving it 5 out of 10. I really want to like this one more than I did. Looks looks pretty, though. Uh, Catching up off is um, definitely the prettiest part about it. So, that's my review of Belfast, everybody. Good night. <laughs> Yeah, I I give it a I I give it a seven. I mean, I thought it was decent. It wasn't my favorite film that I've seen this year, um, but I thought it was uh, worth a watch anyway. I am curious to see uh, how, what it'll win at the Oscars. Hell, it might win Best Picture. I don't know. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I haven't seen any of the other competition. I have to get in touch with Bernard. He's actually seen all the uh, all the films, Ooh. but um just about basically he, he's he's I, I always uh give him props for checking out all the films that come out every year and actually having informed opinion on what should win and what shouldn't win <laughs> although he also um has pretty good guesses of what will win <laughs> yeah he's pretty good at that for sure and uh, speaking of the oscars Devin, what's the next episode <laughs> well here's the thing we've been debating going back and forth because um there is a war happening in Ukraine, and a while ago we were thinking we should look at some films that uh, take place in the Ukraine. And um, one of the f ones, the ones that came up that we were dead set on covering, I think it was called uh, Winter Fire. It's this documentary that Netflix made. It takes place uh, from 2015, and um, that seems like it would give us a good like context for what's happening over there. Um, and then we were looking at some other uh, films as well um, that take place over there. And we think it would be great to cover. Um, but at the same time, the Oscars are also happening. <laughs> and so this is like kind of where I feel pulled between two different things. And I, ha I had this vague idea of maybe we could do a commentary on how, you know, the West likes to be willing the ignorance of problems happening where maybe we do two Oscar films and then that one documentary of the Ukraine. And uh, just to show this kind of pull back and forth, do we want to fall into escapism or do we want to face these problems head on um although some people have uh said that maybe doing a split episode like like that may not be a good idea um but uh steven was in contact with somebody um who knows something about the conflict and um i guess we're gonna lean toward uh doing that um since they're on for uh, next week but um we'll pitch exactly what the uh what the films will be uh later but um, yeah, the the one we're definitely going to be covering is uh, Winter Fire. All right, so look forward to that next week, guys. Uh, thank you so much for listening in. Thank you, Evan, for listening in as well. And uh, is it Thursday yet? 
Have a great night, guys. See you. Thanks for having me, man. Bye. Yeah, thanks for being on it.